some new names and I'm so happy you guys are joining us. We are Daring Adventures. We're located in Phoenix, Arizona and we are doing National Park Trivia Night tonight. Yeah. She's read them three times ahead of time. She's really rough in the wire sticks clothes. All righty, it's six o'clock. I'm gonna give everybody about two more minutes to kind of come in, but I'm gonna kind of start explaining how this is gonna go. So we are having National Park Trivia Night and I have about 20 different questions about different national parks. And I am going to share my screen with you guys right now. Awesome. So we have two different options that we can possibly do for trivia night. And I really wanted to kind of give you guys, whoops. Um, I kind of wanted to give you guys the option to choose whether you would like to use Cahoots, which is another app or another page of your browser that you're going to have to pull up and use this, or we can do it a little bit easier and we can use the raise your hand feature. Raise your hand. Okay, awesome. Raise your hand. I got another, can I get, I, can I get one more for raise your hand and it's raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, sweet, awesome. So can everybody please lower their hands, which is that um, option Y. So if once I see everybody's hands are lowered, um, we can kind of get started. And Jerry, if you possibly could for me be the gatekeeper in terms of who raises their hands first and look at it with a gallery view. I don't know if mine's down or not. It doesn't say. It's not down yet. I need I both know. Nora's and Debbie's hand to be lowered. Okay, Thank there you. we go. All righty. Sarah. Yes. I had a question. What if I downloaded Kahoot on my phone? Can I use it through that or do mm. I have to use it through the... You could use it on that, but we did choose the Okay. Just ask raise me. your hand feature. So that's what we're going to use now. All right. Uh, Sarah, wait, I got to get the screen situated so I see all the participants at once. Absolutely. So hey, Jerry. Up. Hey, you guys. Hi. Hi, Jerry. Howdy. I can't see anybody. Um, All righty. Wait, Sarah, I got to. I'm having trouble getting out of full screen because you have that big window open. So. Yeah, can you can you shrink your window? Because I can't I get everybody up. There you go, right above it. Screen sharing. I have to because it's screen sharing. So how can I get everybody's window up then? Because the gallery view, I only see six at a time. Mm -hmm. Don't you look at the list of participants and then you can tell what hands yes. ring? Absolutely. Think, Thank you so much. I think he just so focuses much. on that. Yeah. Um, Jerry, you're going to go to the participant list. Gosh, you guys are so dang smart. Okay, I'm at the participants list. So now I just watch this for a hand. Absolutely. And the first person that raises their hand will be the first person that gets to answer. And if that person answers okay. wrong, then we will go on to the next person that raises their hand. So please look at the first okay. two. Nora, I need you to lower your hand. Your hand's up. I'm going to try, but this white thing is bothering me. I'm not, yeah, because there are so many videos, my iPad is very slow. Mm. I, I'm having trouble because of my vision. And the screen share, okay. I, there we go. I don't know. I'm gonna to have to go onto my computer. Okay. It's, you go ahead and on your computer. A, I my iPad. Alrighty. 
you can't see. I'm gonna... right, why don't you go ahead and get <laughs> on your, you. your, your computer, Nora, and we are going to get started. Hi, Sydney. Okay, great. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Are you guys ready for the first trivia question? Not really, but yes, we are. All righty. Yep. So, Jerry, be on the lookout for the first two people. All righty. So, the first trivia question is which of these four yeah. presidents? Oh, wait. It's not. Oh, I saw Molly first. So, hold oh. on. Let me finish the question and finish the answers. And then, Molly, you're going to be the first person to answer. I didn't get the pin, Sarah. Sorry. Oh. I was about to type it in. Seriously? That's okay. Tim, use this one and we're raising our hands. We're going to use Sorry. It here. You're okay. So, which of these four presidents is not carved into Mount Rushmore? A, George Washington, B, Donald Trump, C, Theodore Roosevelt, and D, Thomas Jefferson. Molly. B, Donald B. Trump. Good job. You got it correct. Oh, awesome. of course he's not. <laughs> See, you know what, right? Yeah. Can anyone tell me who is the, 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 the president that is missing? It, Lincoln. Absolutely. Abraham Lincoln. Good job. Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. All righty. We're going to move on to the next one. I need everybody to lower your hands. And Jerry, tell me when all the hands are lowered. What? So finish, let her finish the question before you answer, because I can't see the question. Yes, please raise your hand the second that you, I get done finishing all the answers. So you're gonna have to wait a minute. This parkway connects Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. A, John D. Rockefeller Jr. Memorial Parkway. B, Claire Barton Parkway. C. Blue Ridge Parkway or D, George Washington Memorial Parkway? Roto. John D. Oh. Rockefeller. Absolutely. Good job. <laughs> awesome. All righty. Going on to the next question. Let me get it off. What was the first <laughs> national park? Wait, 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 wait. You just did. I can't get the hand up. Can everybody lower your hands? You're not supposed to be raising them yet. All righty. A, Joshua Tree National Park. You're not supposed to raise your hand yet. B, <laughs> Yellowstone National Park. C, Saguaro National Park. Or D, Yosemite National Park. Hey, hand up. Sarah. Saguaro. Which Sarah? Sarah Hawksteckler or the other Sarah? Yeah. We have two Sarahs. Uh, Yellowstone uh, National Park. Oh, I knew that Very good, Sarah. <laughs> Can you tell me uh, when it was signed into law? Here. I don't uh, 1872. You <laughs> are correct. Good job. Do you also know who signed it into law? Theodore Roosevelt, I believe. Oh, no. President okay. Ulysses. S. Grant. I cannot pronounce his oh, first okay. name if anybody knows that. Ulysses. Okay. Ulysses. Very good. Thank you, Debbie. Awesome. Someone's using Google. I'm not using Google. <laughs> I wrote down my facts. Don't you worry. <laughs> not you, sir. <laughs> I'm not using Google. All righty. Are you ready? No. We're going on to the next one. Everybody lower your hands. And remember, you can't raise your hand until I'm done saying the answers. If you, if I see that little hand being raised, <laughs> I'm going to kick you on out for the round. <laughs> All righty. What is the deepest lake in the U.S.? A. Crater Lake. B. Lake Clark. C. Young Lakes. Or D. Sequoia Lake. Roto. You say. Crater Lakes. <laughs> Very good. Crater Lake. Okay, can you tell me where Crater Lake is at? Oregon. Very good. You know how deep it is. 780 feet. 780 feet. Uh, we're going to have to see about that one. <laughs> <laughs> good, because we're not sure. <laughs> you just made that up. I can't get onto my... Please let me know if you can't hear this. Uh, 
probably going to have to take a little bit. Hi folks, I'm Dr. Chapman. Today we're going to learn about Crater oh. Lake National Park, the Cascade Volcanic Arc, and Fluid Flux Mountain. Hello? Crater Lake is a caldera, which is Spanish for cooking pot or cauldron. There's a misconception that calderas form from violent volcanic explosions when a volcano blows its top off, leaving behind a giant hole in the ground. Calderas actually form by the ground collapsing after a magma chamber has been emptied and can no longer support the weight of the overlying rock, like a giant sinkhole. A series of curved normal faults surround calderas known as ring faults. The ring faults terminate in the old magma chamber because only the rock above the chamber dropped down. Caldera collapse can accompany large explosive volcanic eruptions, like in the case of Crater Lake, but calderas can also form during more gentle, effusive eruptions, like the Kilauea Crater in Hawaii. The caldera collapse that formed Crater Lake occurred 7,600 years ago during eruption of Mount Mazama, which is the name of the volcano that Crater Lake is located on. Geologists estimate that Mount Mazama was around 3,700 meters tall before the collapse. Today, the bottom of the caldera is less than 2,000 meters high and is filled with 600 meters of water, making it the deepest lake in the United States. It's so deep! After the main eruption, smaller volumes of magma erupted within the caldera to form small cinder cones. The top of the largest cinder cone sticks out above the water and is called Wizard Island. Tephra is the name for any magma or rock fragments produced by explosive volcanic eruptions. Fragments less than about two millimeters in diameter are called ash. Volcanic ash is easily carried in the wind and can remain in suspension in the air for weeks to months or even longer. Tiny glassy ash particles are a natural abrasive and ash clouds are particularly hazardous to airplanes and can damage their engines. Geology so I'm gonna stop it right there because he gave it. So it was about 600 and something meters. So yes, of course, we're gonna play a little trivia and we're gonna learn. I incorporated a bunch of videos so we can learn something new today. All righty, we're going to the next question. All right, everybody, make sure your hands are lowered. Which president signed the National Park Service into being in 1916? A, George Bush, B, FDR, C, Woodrow Wilson, and D, William Taft. Molly. Uh, C, Woodrow Wilson. Very good, Molly. Uh, You're correct. Here it is. We got some trivia stars in here. All righty. Okay. What causes the blue haze for which the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is named for? A, trash, B, water, C, plants, or D, forest fires? Maybe uh, Molly. Molly. Um, I'm gonna guess and say plants. Correct, you are correct. That is a good, she's in it to win it, folks. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, so let's actually learn about why those mountains are blue. Look to the horizon on a clear day in western North Carolina, and you'll see a soft, dreamy blue haze. These mountains are so blue, the Cherokee tribes native to the region called these mountains Shikanahe, the place of blue smoke. All this dense vegetation is breathing. And while trees are inhaling pollutants like carbon dioxide, they're also exhaling compounds that could be dangerous to your health. But before we start clear cutting the forest, let's back up. The Blue Ridge Mountains are home to at least 150 native tree species. Compare that to Great Britain, which only has less than a quarter of that. The reason this area is so diverse is because it was too far south to be covered by glaciers in the last two ice ages. So these mountains became a refuge for plants and animals escaping the ice. And what you can't see is that this rich assortment of trees are all emitting microscopic VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, 
the source of the Blue Ridge Mountains' signature haze. So there are many multiple layers of leaves in the forest. They're all taking in CO2, they're all giving off moisture, and they're, taking, and they're also producing VOCs. Dr. Howard Neufeld is the Blue Ridge Mountains tree expert. You want me to hug a tree? <laughs> but his other love is air quality and the role that plant VOCs play in it. VOCs are kind of like human pheromones. It's thought that plants emit them to communicate distress and to repel or attract insects. And those may act as signals to nearby plants that, hey, something is munching on me, maybe you'd like to be protected. The smell of freshly cut grass? That's a VOC, and so is that classic Christmas tree smell. Here in the mountains, fine mists of VOC particles scatter blue and violet wavelengths more than the other colors of the light spectrum. And since the color receptors in our eyes are more sensitive to blue than violet, we perceive a blue haze bathing the mountains. But VOCs do more than just scatter blue. This is kind of an environmental paradox, but as trees soak up CO2, they also emit one of the key ingredients of ground-level ozone, a potentially dangerous pollutant. Mix VOCs with the chemicals released from burning fossil fuels, zap them with sunlight, and you'll get ozone. The world's plants emit 500 million tons of VOCs every year, and that can make a lot of ozone. Higher up in the atmosphere, so yes, this plant is the reason why that these mountains are blue. Also, it's good for the plants that they are able to grow so vast um, and basically the way they want to, but it's also creating a lot of pollutants and thickening the ozone layer. But ground. Alrighty, so we're on to our next one. So, the Carbon Glacier in this national park has the greatest has the greatest, thickest volume of any glacier in the continental U.S. Is it A, Mount Rainier National Park? Is it B, Denali National Park? Don't raise your hands just yet. Keep them lowered. C, Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve, or D, the Everglades. Norris. Who was it? Oh. <laughs> Debbie. I'm thinking Glacier Bay. Okay. So it is actually A, Mount Rainier. And the glacier is 700 feet thick. And that's in Washington. All righty. So now we're going to the most massive single mountain on earth is located in which national park? A, Rocky Mountain National Park, B, Yosemite National Park, C, Zion National Park, or D, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park? Molly. That would be Yosemite National Park. That is incorrect. All righty, who is the is second your, person? Is your, is your picture um, different than the answer? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. trying to throw you guys off. You are, yeah. You should have, I had one question in here that it was about all these, like, um, like the explorers, and I put Christopher Columbus in here, and I thought I would really throw you guys off, but I took it out. But yes, I am trying to throw you off. So no, it is not Yosemite. Who was the second person? It was Sarah. Sarah with an H or Sarah without an H? Uh, Sarah without an H. Sarah without an H. Did you raise your hand? Do you have a question? Do you have an answer for me? It's not Yosemite. Yes. It's um, A. 
It is not the Rocky Mountain National Park. Does anyone know what it is? Zion. It's not Zion. Alrighty. Hawaii. Same thing I wrote up. It is the Hawaii <laughs> Volcanoes. Yeah. Hmm. We have a it daughter is, that lives there. <laughs> it's Mauna Loa. I don't know if I pronounced that correct. Mauna Loa. That's very good. Mauna Loa. And it is actually taller and bigger than Mount Everest in height and mass. Well, maybe it's not close enough to you. Oh. It erupted 33 times, and that's probably why. Just in December. She's still looking in the air. She's still looking in the air. All righty. The Kilauea. All righty. So our next question is, which of the following national parks is the newest? A, New River Gorge, B, Great Sand Dunes National Park, C, St. Louis Gateway Arch, or D, Indiana Dunes National Park? Larry. I think D. So you would have been correct if we were a couple of years ago. Next is Tim. What about, all right, Tim. Well, he just is Tim. I actually said it wrong. I meant to say C. All righty. Anyone else? How about Roto? New River Gorge. Gorge. You are correct, Roto. It is the New River Gorge. So it actually got signed in this year, 2021. And it was a, from a COVID stimulus package. They actually signed this in. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of river running and rock climbing here. And it's in Virginia. All righty. Next question. What national park reaches into three states? And yes, I, those are the three states that it reaches into. A, Great Smoky Mountains, B, Death Valley, C, Yellowstone National Park, and D, Grand Canyon National Park. Let's do some Larry. process of eliminations. I'm going to say C, Yellowstone. You are correct. Point for Larry. All righty. Next question. What was not a tool used to carve the monument on Mount Rushmore? A, a jackhammer. B, hammer and chisel. C, dynamite. D, knives. Molly. I'm gonna guess jackhammer. You are incorrect. Who was next? Marianne. 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 Dynamite. You are incorrect. I saw Larry. I say C, dynamite. No, she already said that. What is not, that was already used. Okay. Alrighty. So we have Tim. Jackhammer. No. <laughs> you were saying. Debbie. What was not a tool used? Knives. <laughs> Obviously. Who Did said knives? I, okay. <laughs> Who was the one that said knives? Roto. Yes, it is knives. You are correct. So actually, I thought it was just going to be dynamite because when I looked it up originally, it just said dynamite, but it actually brought us some facts. So let's check it out. They are as monumental and inspiring as the men they represent. In this week's scrapbook, Nicole takes us to Mount Rushmore. It's a colossus you can see from Rhodes, miles away. Four American presidents carved in granite stare nobly out across the Black Hills of South Dakota. Everything about Mount Rushmore is huge. The heads are as tall as six-story buildings. 
At 21 feet, you could park a minivan on George Washington's nose and still have room left over. Why of all places in the country, South Dakota? Well, Don Robinson, the South Dakota State historian, he wanted to bring tourists to visit South Dakota. That's how it all got started, tourism. The man hired to carve the mountain was sculptor Gutzen Borglum. Assisted by 400 workers, he started in 1927. The project took 14 years to complete. The final head was unveiled in 1941. This is one of the jackhammers they used on the mountain. It weighs about 30 pounds. They had to drill sometimes horizontal and sometimes vertically. And one day's worth of drilling, they go through about 400 of these drill bits in one day. After all the holes were drilled, the next thing they had to do was remove a lot of rock really fast. And they would use dynamite. If they wanted a big blast, use a big stick. If they got closer and closer to where the heads were going to be, they start cutting the sticks down and use smaller sticks of dynamite. And then a prime example of how they removed the rock was the honeycombing technique on this wall over here. We're drilling about an inch apart, about three inches, whatever rock they had to remove, and then we got their hammer and chisels and just chisel this rock off and it'll fall right down. A safe way of removing the rock. Right now the heads are done, but they're not smooth yet. And what Borglum did, he showed his men how to use a small bumper tool. What it consists of is a little air hammer and a four-pronged steel drill bit. It would simply sit right in here. You turn this on with the big air compressors, this thing would move in and out like that, and it would smooth the faces. Picture yourself doing every square inch of Mount Rushmore with this tool, and that's how the faces are smooth. Why did Borglum pick these four presidents? Well, he wanted to represent 150 years of American history. So George Washington, the father of our country, that's the birth of our nation. Thomas Jefferson's up there for the expansion of our country with the Louisiana Territory. Abraham Lincoln, the preserver of our union after the Civil War, get us all back together again as one country. And Theodore Roosevelt, taking us into the new century, the development of our country. Near the foot of the mountain, you can visit the sculptor's studio. Inside is the 20-foot model Borglum so, yes, they used all those different types of tools to build Mount Rushmore. All righty. We're going to go to the next question. All righty. Which national park is the least visited of all 62 national parks? A. Kobuk Valley National Park, B, Great Smoky Mountain Mount, Mountains, C, Olympic National Park, or D, Gates of the Arctic, Alaska. I saw Marianne first. Marianne. Gates of the Arctic. You are correct. Woo! Gates of the Arctic only has about 10 to 11,000 visitors a year because it's very hard to reach because there are virtually no roads. And it's about a 12 hour drive from Anchorage. Wow. <laughs> How many visitors do they get a year? About 10 to 11,000. Do you know, oh. they're also the one that gets most visitors is on this list as well. Can anyone tell me who they think that Probably gets the most visitors. Mm -hmm. You the Great Smoky list? Mountains. Yes, the Great Smoky Mountains, correct. All righty. Something that we all hold very, very dear. All righty. Make sure you lower your hands until I, I, I finish the question. Which is deeper, Kings Canyon and Kings Canyon National Park or the Grand Canyon and Grand Canyon National Park? Jerry, Debbie, did you see who that was? Yep, Debbie was first. I'm gonna guess Grand Canyon. All righty, Debbie, you're actually wrong. So the Kings Canyon is 8,200 feet deep. And the Grand Canyon is only 5,000 and 200 feet deep. All righty, next question. What national park has been banned nearly year round from vehicles from its road during peak season? A, Zion National Park, 
B, Mesa Verde National Park, C, Isle Royale National Park, and D, White Sands National Park. Molly. Uh, C, Isle Royale National Park. No, that is incorrect. Second is person. Larry. 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 They just said C, I think. I'm going to guess D, White Sands. No, that is incorrect. And then we have Debbie. I'm going to guess Mesa Verde. Nope, that is incorrect. <laughs> All righty. The answer was actually Zion. And the reason why I knew this was because I've gone to Zion twice during peak season and not during peak season. Now, unfortunately, I got there at like six o'clock, but they close all the buses at like eight o'clock. So I only had two hours to see Zion because I got there too late and you're not allowed to take your personal car during their peak season because the road is only five miles. And if everybody was driving on that road and parking, since Zion is very popular, there is not enough places to park and it would overcrowd the park. So it wouldn't be as awesome and it would be too polluted by cars. The nature would be, so that's why. All righty, which shape is the emblem of the National Park Service? A, a tent, B, an octagon, C, an arrowhead or D, circle. Larry? I'm gonna say A, tent. That is incorrect. Next one was Sarah with an H. Okay, um, I'm gonna actually go with a uh, circle. That is incorrect. Ah. <laughs> then we have Tim. Hmm. Arrowhead, C. You are correct, Tim, good job. What are these naturally sculpted towers found in Bryce Canyon called? A, hoodoos, B, voodoos, C, stacks, or D, towers? Molly. A, hoodoos. You are correct. Woo! You know how they are formed, Molly. Oh, is it from wind? It is from rain, water, and wind, and we're going to learn more. <laughs> there is nothing more magical than a sunrise at Bryce Canyon as the morning rays creep over the canyon's famous hoodoos. These layers that make these colorful hoodoos at Bryce Canyon were deposited in a freshwater lake only about 40 million years ago. And much of the modern landscape was coming into existence when the rocks at Bryce Canyon were laid down. A lot of people really like these colorful hoodoos at Bryce because you're very intimate with them when you go there. The park is not large. It's easy to get close to all of the features at Bryce. And sometimes you get this reflected light back onto the hoodoos and it makes them almost come alive for people when they visit there. So how did these hoodoos come to be? At the time these ancient lakes existed, this area of the Colorado Plateau was a giant basin, and although water could flow in, there were no rivers to carry the water out. Instead, sediment forming at the bottom of the lakes just kept building up. Kevin Poe, affectionately called the singing geologist, gives talks at Bryce. He compares the sediment to the residue in a bottle containing an instant orange drink, Tang. Um, sediment, yes, of course, okay. So here we are on the top of Dutton's Grand Staircase, which he called the Pink Cliffs, which is, I mean, you know, was the guy colorblind? I mean, come on, this is orange, right? 
Um, well, it wasn't that he was colorblind, it's just that Dutton never really got very close, as it turns out. When you look at this same layer of rock, clear out on the horizon there, there's the Powell Point, named for Dutton's boss, John Wesley Powell, uh, and you'll see when you have to look through all that atmosphere disturbance, the rock does kind of turn pink. But when you're sitting right on top of it, it's orange, because of course, that was the ingredient, iron, in this lake system, right? And you know, and it wasn't tang, it was limestone, but limestone, like sugar, does completely dissolve in water up until the saturation point. And so with this lake, more and more limestone being added, kind of like the tang attic, eventually you start to get the sediment forming at the bottom. And instead of orange 47 or whatever the heck this artificial color is, it was the iron that mixed in there to give it that beautiful color. Now the rest of the story is that the Colorado Plateau finally begins to rise. When it rises, it rises so that what was a lake basin before gets turned wrong side out. You know, it gets lifted up high, so now the lake drains, and all that ooze left behind could lithify to become the rock and the limestone that is Bryce Canyon. And as I kind of look through your faces here in the audience today, I can see that pretty much none of you really care about that. And uh, that's okay, because they make me say all that stuff at the beginning about how the rock forms. But come on, I know what's really going on. The reason why you pay $25 to get in here is not to know about how the rock formed, but to celebrate how the rock is being destroyed, right? That's what makes us special. Because first of all, we're not even a real canyon. What do you, what do you got to have to be a real canyon? Yeah, you got to have a river running through it. And even in a torrential downpour, you know, just water falling from the sky, buckets and buckets, um, we get a little tiny creek at the bottom. But as soon as the rain stops, well, the creek soaks into the ground, and that's it, okay? What you see out there is carved by water, but it's not flowing water. It's the freezing and thawing of water, frost wedging. So imagine that rock out there with all the different cracks in it. You could take my hand here and pretend it's one of these fins, one of these walls that sticks out. And, of course, it has cracks like the gaps between my fingers. And now you put some snow on top of it. And so let's say that it's like January, okay? Um, and because even though it's really cold at night, for several hours during the afternoon, it's above freezing. So that snow melts and has water, it trickles down inside the cracks, and then later at night when it freezes, what happens? It expands, good, as water turns to ice, it expands. But it, it also does something else. It does, because think about it this way, when water boils, it also expands. But when water freezes, it expands and gets hard. Who said that? I heard it somewhere, hard, yeah, exactly right. My old mean geology professor used to give us a zero on the entire exam if you didn't remember get hard. And then, and then what he would say is um, decrease your density and get harder. Think about that for a minute, right? There's only one substance in the universe that can do that, and that's water. And that was the point he was trying to make, a spectacular process to you know, expand and yet get harder. And so as water does this, it starts forcing apart holes in the rock. Eventually, that hole becomes so large, it can no longer support its weight, and the roof caves in, and the delicate, sticky-up things on either side, that's a hoodoo. That's, that's how they form. And those hundreds upon thousands of them you see out there were different parts of cracks and holes in rocks and now stand by themselves. So one last song about the ultimate fate of my beloved Bryce Canyon. So that was how hoodoos are formed, basically from rainwater and snow and it basically expanding and cracking and pulling through. I thought we were going to hear that song. I know, I was going to hear, I want to hear the song. <laughs> oh, I'll no. sing it. <laughs> are you ready, Jerry? No, okay. One, two, three. Okay. No. <laughs> Next question, which state has the most national parks? A, Arizona, B, Utah, C, Mississippi, or D, California? Roto. California. Absolutely. Can you tell me, Roto, do you know how many California may have? How many to what? How many they have? Eight. No, they have nine. Arizona oh. has eight. They got a new one, I'm pretty sure, a couple years back, which led them to nine. But you got that correct. They have the most. It goes California, Arizona, Utah, Mississippi. All righty. I threw this one in here, and I'm hoping that everybody knows. Which river carved the Grand Canyon? A, Gila River, B, the San Juan, C, Colorado River, or D, the Verde River? Pam. Colorado. No. Absolutely. Colorado. 
the Colorado River. If you've been with a participant with Daring Adventures, you know that we have made an expedition, which is taking the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. Say it should be called the Proof. All righty. What major event happened at Arc Acadia National Park in 1947? Was it A? a forest fire that burned down more than 17,000 acres? Was it B, an avalanche that killed two people? C, a flash flood that led to 36 deaths? Or D, the park had to shut down due to bombings? Sarah. Okay, um, I'm gonna actually go with C. With D? No, C. C. With C? C is incorrect. Oh, no. Roto. Forest fires. Absolutely. It was the Bar Harbor Fire in Maine, and it definitely burned more than 17,000 acres. And a lot of that was in Acadia and a bunch of homes as well. And that's why I go to school. <laughs> <laughs> We like that. Keep going to school. We love that. <laughs> All righty. Next question. We have a question. plant here. <laughs> I know, huh? Mammoth National Park is the largest cave system in the world. This is the last question. What state is it in? Don't answer this question. Okay. Sorry. My friend's here with from that state. A, New Mexico. B, Oregon, or Oregon, however you like to pronounce it. C, South Carolina, or D, Kentucky. I saw Molly. Molly. Um, is it New Mexico? No, incorrect. Marianne. <laughs> Oregon. No, incorrect. Roto. <laughs> Very good, it is in Kentucky. <laughs> All righty, I actually have this cool little video for us. This is our last video while I tally up all the points. With hundreds of miles of caves crisscrossing an area only seven miles wide and less than 400 feet deep, Mammoth Cave is a relatively shallow cave system. The historic tour route includes the oldest toured section of Mammoth Cave, so it's had the most visitors over the years. Using 3D laser scanning technology, caves can be mapped in great detail, creating perspectives of Mammoth Cave that have never been seen before. fascinated with the puzzle and mammoth is for me the biggest and most interesting puzzle because I've been in a lot of caves they all ended eventually this cave just keeps going and going and going all righty so my next so the prizes are for first place I have a national park puzzle or shirt you get to pick second place a national park hat and some tokens. Third place, a national park patch and a sticker. And these are going to be mailed out to the winners. So if 
I do call your name once I announce the winners right now. Um, just please send me your email in the chat so that I can send you an email so I can get your address and mail out your gifts to you. And your Sarah, what are the tokens? Where do the they tokens get are, they're silver and they have like a, like a hole in them, kind of like a washer. And they say Joshua Tree or the oh. Grand Canyon and they're collectibles. Mm. Cool. All righty. So third place with two goes to Tim Holtz. So Tim, if you could please send me whatever address, I actually have your phone number so you don't have to. Um, and I know where you live, so I will get your park patch and stickers to you. All right. Awesome. Congratulations. Woo. Runner up is Molly. You get a park hat and tokens. Molly, if you Yay. could Thank please you. send me your email in the chat real quick so that I can copy that and get that to you. I will. Thank you so much. That's the prize I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm excited. You're Already smart. in first place. Last but not least, Roto. And you get a park okay. puzzle, a national park puzzle, or a t shirt. Which one would you like? Puzzle. Okay. Roto, I have your email, so I will definitely get with you and I will get you your puzzle. And, and this is Riker, our grandson. Hi, Riker. I want you to come come exploring with us. We like to go camping and hiking. Doesn't that I feel love, like so much fun? I love hiking and camping. <laughs> awesome. I can't wait to have you out of family camp with us once that we can all finally see each other. Yes. Well, yeah, that's fun. the end of our trivia night. But <laughs> next month, I'm planning um, another basically nature cognitive game. I think it's going to either be Jeopardy or Bingo, and it's going to be more about the state parks here in Arizona. And then I'm also going to be doing probably a pet, bring your pet to Zoom night, where we kind of <laughs> introduce all our pets to each other. And I'm going to try to find some some of my friends that have some pretty cool animals to bring their animals on as well. Oh, cool. So that's going to be the last, I think they're moving to Mondays. And I think it's the last two Mondays in February. We do have the save the date on our newsletter if you haven't seen it already. And thank you guys so much for joining Daring Adventures for our national trivia night. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Daring Adventures. We record all of these and we post them onto YouTube, also on our website, um, so that you guys can, maybe you wanna come back and watch some of those videos or you wanna remember one of the answers to the questions, you can come back and watch um, this video a little bit later on on our YouTube. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Nora. that was fun. Thank you. Um,